Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Hope you all are doing well. Today, I want to talk about time series data modeling in Cassandra. Cassandra is a very common database to use if you want to store time series data. However, to get the best performance out of it, you want to design your schema correctly. At first, we're going to look at some common Cassandra design principles. I went through all of these in two other videos in the channel, so I would recommend uh, checking those out before uh, coming to this one. So the first one is to keep your partition small. Cassandra stores data in partitions and it depends on your schema how Cassandra writes to different partitions. So during design time you want to make sure that your partitions are small. You also want to keep the partitions bounded so that over time they just don't keep on growing indefinitely. Lastly, you want to keep your partitions and queries in such a way that one query reads from one partition only. When you have one query that reads from multiple per partitions, you start running into a lot of performance issues. Now let's take a look at the data we're going to be working with. So here we have some example time series data. Uh, imagine that you own a truck company and you have hundreds or thousands of trucks all over the world. Each truck is fitted with a GPS machine, which is emitting a latitude and longitude every couple of minutes or a couple of seconds. Uh, if you look at the columns we have, we have truck ID, which is the ID unique to every truck. We have A, B, and C. We have the latitude and longitude, which represents the location of the truck. And we have the timestamp. This is the timestamp of uh, when the data was emitted by the truck. Given the nature of a GPS machine, these are going to be emitting a location every few minutes or every few seconds. So over time, you will have quite a lot of data for every truck. So the first approach is you partition your data by truck so that truck A has all its data in one partition, truck B has all of its data in one partition, and truck C has all of its data in a third partition, right? So if you have, let's say, 20 trucks, you have 20 partitions, and each partition will contain all the data for that one truck. When it comes to defining the primary key, in this case, if you remember from the previous video, in a primary key, the first field is your partition key, un unless you mention that you want a compound partition key. In this case, in what you're looking at, the way you're defining your primary key, truck ID is going to be your partition key. So there are a few problems with this approach. Let's talk about those at first. Each partition in this design, each partition contains all the data coming from one truck. So what's the problem with that? That means the partitions are going to grow unbounded right because you have truck a which can be in service for 10 20 years then all your data over the 10 20 years for that truck is going to end up in the same partition same if you have let's say 30 trucks over 20 years you will have only 30 partitions and each partition will have 20 years worth of data which at the beginning might be okay but over time it's going to get very bad so that's the problem and hence I wouldn't recommend this approach. Now let's take a look at the second approach which is to partition by truck and date. So over here you can see we have six partitions. Let's take a look at the first row which is uh, from left to right we have three partitions. Each partition is uh, each partition contains data for one truck on a given day. So if you look at your top left you have truck A on uh, 1st June 2021 and then the next partition is truck A 2nd June and the third one is 3rd June. So every partition has one truck's worth of data for that one day. If you look at the second row we have truck B which has three partitions for three different days. So does truck C. So essentially what you're doing is you're partitioning by truck ID and date. When it comes to defining the primary key, this is how you define a composite partition key. So you uh, group together truck ID and day, which becomes your partition key. So let's talk about this approach now, right? So each partition 
holds one truck's data for one day. As we saw in the example, each partition is one truck for one day. If you have five days for the same truck, you'll have five partitions. All right, so now the next one is the partitions this way, uh, the partitions are bounded, right? Because you have one truck's worth of data for one day. So once that day is over, for the next day, we are gonna create a new partition. So you know when uh, the partition is gonna stop being written to. This way you wanna you can make sure that your partitions are bounded. Now you might have an issue where you, every day, even for one truck, the data is so much that your partitions are still growing huge over one day, but that's a different problem altogether. You have a predictable partition size. That means uh, you know uh, beforehand how many times your GPS machine is gonna fire off on a given day. So for every truck, you can estimate beforehand how many rows of data you will have in a given partition. That is very important to do in Cassandra because you don't wanna uh, ha you, you don't wanna design it in such a way that your partitions grow out of control very quickly. And then to make concurrent uh, to make a query to get multiple days worth of data, you can make concurrent queries, right? So let's take a look at this again. So remember I said that one query should only talk to one partition. So let's say in this case, you wanna get all the rows from the last three days. So instead of writing one query that's gonna talk to all three of the partition, you wanna write three queries, which what, let's say the first query gets all the data for first June, the second query, second June, and the third query, third June. So in Cassandra, you can kick them off concurrently and then gather the data together. This is the best way to query the data rather than having one query that talks to multiple partitions. Uh, and uh, following up on that one, uh, if you do it in that way, the concurrent queries, you spread the work over the whole cluster rather than making this one query do all the job and putting much more stress on the cluster. So that is the uh, more that is the recommended approach for time series data if it's relatively simple in nature, but you can improve it further by adding one small uh, thing, which is adding TTL to your data. TTL is time to live. That, mean, that means when inserting data, you tell Cassandra to delete the data after a set amount of time. This is not gonna apply to all use cases, but in a lot of use cases where you're using Cassandra as a transactional database to serve some kind of a user or some kind of a web app, uh, it might come handy. All right, so uh, let's talk about the use case where you can use TTL to make the performance of this even better. Let's say you need only the last 30 or 90 days worth of data on demand. So uh, let's say you your application have, uh, in your application you have a graph where you show the location of each truck in the last 30 days, 60 days, and 90 days, right? So after 90 days, you don't really need the data in Cassandra. Maybe you need the data somewhere else, but not in Cassandra. In that case, when you are writing the data into Cassandra, you can insert it with a TTL of 30 day or 90 day. What that means is after 30 day or 90 day, Cassandra is gonna automatically delete the data, right? So what is gonna end up happening is you will have a limited number of partitions because you know like if you only keep 30 days worth of data, and you have 10 trucks, then each truck on a given day will get one partition. So you have 10 times 30, which is 300 partition. So even 20 years from now, you are gonna have 300 partitions. That way you're making sure that the partitions are bounded and you also have a limited number of them. Uh, but of course, that might bring in the question, then what happens? Are you gonna lose the data? Hopefully you won't lose the data because in a use case like that, what you want is some kind of a data pipeline set up where every time you're writing to Cassandra, you're also archiving the Cassandra data into a storage like S3 or Redshift or some kind of a data lake. This is gonna be your uh, cold storage of data 
or this is gonna be your aggregated storage of data where you can run other queries. But in Cassandra, you're only gonna have the last 30 or 90 days, 30 to 90 days. This way, whatever graph or user-facing application Cassandra is serving can do it fine over a very long time. But at the same time, for your more historical use cases, you can use Redshift, Data Lake, S3, or some other database uh, file store or file storage. So that is some way you can uh, improve on approach two that I talked about. But having TTL is a very niche use case. If you want to have historical data in Cassandra, using approach two should be good for you. And there are still unique cases where you might need a different approach. But in most time series data uh, use cases, approach two that I talked about should be good enough. Uh, I think that's all I had today. So hopefully that was helpful. If you have any questions, just leave it in the comments and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. With that being said, hopefully y'all uh, found something helpful in the video and I'll catch y'all in the next one. Bye-bye.